Steve. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to session 57 of Libraries in Response. Uh, a campaign, I guess you could call it, that we started now just over 18 months ago in response to the pandemic and all the changes that that has caused everybody. We've got a packed session today. I'm gonna to do a little intro and then uh, we'll get, get to the various topics. So where I am, hatted today in Parkwood, is uh, outside of the uh, Cuesta, New Mexico, Public Library. I don't know if you can see it, but there it is. This is this is their brand new library. It wasn't here last year, but thanks to these wonderful civic-minded librarians of uh, northern New Mexico, you can see it back there, uh, where I am uh, camping out. I, I'd be stuck. Uh, without this uh, open Wi-Fi uh, outside the building, it's just closed and is you know it won't open till noon. But they uh, they run a really nice Wi-Fi signal out here that I'm tapping into, which is enabling me to do this. It's just the kind of thing we've been advocating for years. So let me get happening here with the uh, screen share. And here we are. Uh, I'd like to ask everybody to include their affiliation and their name so we can kind of have a better uh, understanding of who's who and who's with us today. Uh, and I think we have quite a few first timers. So in the chat, if you wouldn't mind just saying, you know, first time or something like that, we'd appreciate it. Uh, I know many of you are returning and they've been regulars with us for. Well, maybe not all 57, but uh, a number of these, quite a few of these, and it's, it's great to have you back. So uh, this is part two of Fiber to Wireless, and I hope you made it two weeks ago when we had the CEO of Scenic, the, the California Research and Education Network, on uh, with uh, Crosby Kemper, the, the IMLS director, talking about fiber. And, and Crosby, of course, talked about access and equity and all the things that the IMLS does. But uh, uh, Lewis Fox, the CEO of Scenic, talked about this new multi-billion dollar fiber uh, campaign that California is uh, undertaking to connect every community. And that starts with connecting all the anchor institutions, most especially, at least in our uh, viewpoint, the libraries, which are underserved by comparison to other anchor institutions. They just have had less wherewithal to go through the, uh, the requirements of uh, getting enough E-rate support to actually get services. And that presumes that it's even available. The schools have an advantage because they're just bigger institutions and so forth. So most of the schools are really well wired by now, but a lot of rural libraries are not. And that's been our focus for, well, a long time. Uh, we initiated Fiber to the Library as a campaign in 2007 saying the cheapest, most equitable, most economical way to connect every community with next generation broadband was to run fiber to all of the 17,000 libraries. And we're still on that. <laughs> We thought it would be like a three to five year project and it's now 14 years later and we're, we're still not there, but we've made, we've made good strides. Um, this series is produced by our ad hoc organization, the Gigabit Libraries Network, in a partnership with IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, based in The Hague and at the controls, uh, uh, doing the recording today and hosting the Zoom session is Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA and a longtime colleague uh, in advocacy for public access. we get to that a little bit. Our session sponsors the Internet Society, remarkable organization that has uh, 
been supportive of a whole number of access causes, uh, one of which is this. So today we're going to, uh, whoops, that should be part two, excuse me for that. Uh, we're gonna get into the wireless strategy. So the basic idea is fiber to the library and then wireless through the library. Or if you don't have fiber to the library, then maybe wireless to the library. So there are a lot of ways to do this and we're gonna to touch on a number of them. Uh, this also represents a, uh, the end, a report of a three-year project, which is an IMLS grant, the community's second net, second net project, uh, which is about wireless and how libraries as second responders and disasters can use wireless to increase access and resilience in a community. The thing that happened during this was that that dual use uh, application became almost the same use. That is to say that simple access in the context of the pandemic is a response to a disaster, a disaster like we haven't seen really ever. Uh, and libraries, have, as you all know, we've talked about this for the last year and a half, have responded in a number of different ways. We have with us today, Diane Connery, the librarian from Pottsboro. Uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, her project there. One of our, what, these are all uh, projects that we've supported through the IMLS grant. Uh, we also have Heather Lamb and Jacob Bowser uh, from Castleberry ISD doing a partnership with the public library there. And then I'll touch on a project in Nebraska uh, using uh, five gigahertz uh, uh, microwave to do long range uh, connection to a library in this little town of 400 people. And then Conrad Montana uh, has just come up with our latest version of wireless, which is uh, low earth orbit satellite connections, which is fascinating. And then we'll see if we have any other speakers turn up. So these are, the, we're gonna go through these technologies. This, I'm sorry if this is gonna be a little more technical today than then, uh, well, actually we do a lot of technical sessions, so this will be one more. But these are the technologies that, that we've used. They're, these are not the only ones, but it's pretty much most of them that are available for people to use or for, uh, well, even commercial enterprises. The service models combine in different ways with technologies. The whole point of this is that this is so not one size fits all. This is, Every community is unique. It's a unique combination of, of uh, density, of uh, topology, of socioeconomics, of existing infrastructure, and also available spectrum, which are different spectrum are available in different places. And then, you know, whatever the local policy priorities are. So from the vendor side, providers like to see the world very homogenous. That is to say they would prefer one size to fit all. It's just more economic for them. But it doesn't work that way. And our goal has been to delve into these different technologies and how they could work in different places. So, so the communities, hopefully led by or facilitated by their libraries could initiate discussions on their own infrastructure and what they want it to be and do and how. Whatever technology, whatever business model, that's secondary to uh, the, the need for each community to have a, a formal strategy about their infrastructure. And that of course includes fiber and wireless. And here I've got it right by this time, part two. So uh, we usually do a COVID report. I'm going to dispense with that today. We're probably kind of, we're all sick of COVID, hopefully sick of it and not sick with it. But, uh, you know, everybody's following it. We're into booster confusion now, but, uh, you know, we're making progress, it feels like. Uh, in the backdrop of what seems like an unprecedented global catastrophe, we have major disaster looming in climate change. Per the IPCC's latest report, we have inevitable and irreversible climate changes to deal with. So just keep that in your hat. And anytime you're doing a plan, any plan almost, it'd be advisable to consider uh, extreme weather events or the most obvious thing but other kinds of changes, which are looking a little more subtle, but no, nonetheless uh, severe. So we all need to be involved in this uh, to 
paraphrase Marshall McLuhan, paraphrasing Buckminster Fuller, uh, there are no passengers on spaceship Earth, only crew. So, uh, okay, let's get to the session here. And the objective of all this is, is access, is access to public library Wi-Fi, in effect, at least as far as the wireless is concerned. And most of us connect to the internet wireless, like I'm doing it right now, like most of you are probably with Wi-Fi that is connected to some kind of a wireline connection probably. This is, a, this is our favorite uh, illustration of a, uh, a neighborhood library access station. So I think this is in Tennessee somewhere. I just came across the image and loved it. So it shows somebody kind of similar to what I am doing here, but this is not actually a library facility per se, but it is a library outlet. And you can see there's solar panels on the, on the shade there and, and charging stations on the pole place to sit. And even a little free library over there, which is which is pretty cute. Um, we think that there should be one of these, some type of this facility uh, in every neighborhood. Everyone should be within easy access, walking distance, ideally, of some kind of a, a of an access station. And this is what libraries are in the business of doing ordinarily every day at the library, but they require everyone to come to the library. And that's not easy or convenient for a lot of people. Uh, the committee's second nets is the project. And that is found on our, it's one of the menu items on the gigabitlibraries.net, giglibraries.net uh, uh, homepage. And you'll see, if you haven't seen it already, we put it in the invitation. It lists all of the projects that we've done through this, through this current grant, this true IMLS grant, summarizes those and has links to a number of the presentations which we've done on these uh, sessions by uh, different project leaders, two of which we have with us today. And so their full presentations are all available on that list, uh, on, on both on that list and on our pandemic response page, which has every session we've done video recorded and archived as this will be and it'll be up by Monday. So that's where the background is and, and the deep detail where I'm trying to get through this session, this introduction and these uh, high points quickly enough so that we can uh, get into a more interactive discussion, depending on which of these technologies or business models or any other questions anybody's interested in. So this is a, an early one. This is kind of a standard TV white space uh, set up. You can see it's a little bit light, but uh, the, the gold star there is the, is the library. This is a DIY system using television uh, white spaces, which are open spectrum in the TV band. These are sub gigahertz frequencies that have long range, miles and miles, and, uh, uh, and, and are good in remote areas because in urban areas, these frequencies are not available. They're all being used by radio and TV broadcasters. But you can see the red stars uh, where the remote location wrote, look, radios are located, the library of hotspots. Even the three that are in the park in the center of that are too far apart from normal Wi-Fi uh, 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 range. And then the, uh, the one to the bottom is a, is a senior center uh, and, and they love it. It works. So this is, you know, they install the radio. They actually put this one inside of a building there in the playground and they put up a sign, a physical sign, which we think is tremendous advertising, marketing for the, for the library. You know, you've entered a library service zone. Welcome, where would you like to go? Log on to a splash page. Uh, ideally you would say, you know, now they don't do it here. I'm, I'm at the Cuesta library. I just selected the router and I'm on. But I think they've missed an opportunity to say, Welcome to the library. Here's your free Wi-Fi. Where would you like to go? Would you like to go to the internet? Would you like to check out a book? Talk to the librarian. So don't miss those opportunities to, to let people know that you're providing a service beyond the building. Uh, uh, so this is another one of the, of the wireless technologies, uh, uh, CBRS, Citizen Span Radio Services. This is in the 3.5 gigahertz range, and it is an excellent uh, technology that's very hot now, and these are being built uh, all over the place. Uh, and uh, with us, we have today 
Jacob Bowser and Heather Lamb, who uh, work for the, uh, the Castleberry Independent School District and have partnered with the public library to set up these neighborhood uh, access stations. So I'm gonna pause right here and we'll go over to Jacob and Heather and they can give us a uh, update on the project and then we'll get back to the sequence. So welcome Jacob, Heather, please take it away. Great, thank you very much. Um, so um, Heather Lamb is here with me. Um, I think she wanted to give sort of a background of um, what we're doing with the project and um, you know where we're going with it in the future. So Heather, if you wanna take over, um, would you like me to do the slides or do you wanna do that? No, you can, I think if you want to Jacob, that's fine. Okay. So thank you everyone for the opportunity. We're um, pretty passionate about um, this uh, project and the opportunity that um, this has enabled us um, to have it. We, um, we've had um, great success with our bus and this has just um, enabled us to do even more. So we call our um, program Books and Bytes and um, I am the uh, lead librarian and the high school librarian in the district and um, Jacob is the brains behind um, and he can tell you more. He's the brains behind all of this and I'm um, I don't know any of the technology. Um, Castleberry is a, is a um, kind of a neat little district. We're just seven schools, um, but we're a seven square mile footprint um, and in kind of the heart of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, closer to um, Fort Worth, um, the city of Fort Worth. Um, we, are, we are considered a Title I district. We're um, very much economically disadvantaged and um, our enrollment is just over 3,600 kids, but um, uniquely, we um, we had an opportunity to, um, Jacob can tell you more about our tower project. We call it a digital equity for all. So all of our students have a device um, that they are provided starting in, um, well, pre-K um, and all the way up through high school. So um, but a challenge that we have is, so our students have devices and they have um, free filtered internet access, but our community has a challenge because they don't have um, internet. So our students have internet when they're in school, but our community didn't have internet. And so how do we keep our community connected was a challenge that we had. And um, we had a public library, but unfortunately due the, to the pandemic, um, the library was temporarily closed and then it permanently closed. That was our that was our local public library. It did permanently close, so we had to find a, diff a different solution. And then this was a prime opportunity for us. Um, and it, it was a wonderful opportunity um, that landed. And so we were very excited. And um, fortunately for us, we have um, we are so small, so we capitalized on some of uh, the relationships that we built. And one of the relationships was the, um, the location that Don mentioned, that community. Um, it's called the, we now, it's called the River Oaks Event Center. And that's our, so what we did is we brainstormed and uh, looked at our topography, looked at um, everything and, and what do we already have in place? What are the relationships that we have built? Um, what do we already have in place that we can already work with? And, and then who, who do we have in place and what we already know about libraries. And um, although we would love, I'm a librarian and all I, although I would love to say librarians, libraries are all about books. We know it's really about, and I think you said this, it's all about access. And people go, people go to libraries, um, because that's, they go when they need help. That's, I think somebody said this or I heard it or read it or something, but they go and it's, and access provides that. And so they go, um, if you go to a library nowadays, you probably see, you might see people reading, but you, you see people on computers. And just like the pictures that you showed, um, they're there connecting. And Don, you showed, a, I, I love it because I've done the same thing. I go because I need access. And so we had to figure out uh, a plan for us and our community center was one of our plans and um, and then the other side of our plan is we have a mobile 
bookmobile. His name is Mo. And, um, and so what we did is we, we um, created kind of an extension of our, um, kind of an extension of our books, bookmobile program, um, which provides access to books and literacy. We said, how can we um, combine the two? We already know that we have success with the bookmobile, but how can we take the bookmobile and get it into further into the community. The kids are already coming to the, and the parents are already coming to this. This is our neighborhood access station. So we already have them already coming. They already come to this access station because they have a clothes closet. They already come to this access station because there's a food bank. So it just made sense to us to put this as our access station. And then, for mobility, we've done something now because of, so this is Mo. And so Jacob being the mastermind, um, he he's gonna talk about what we've done. So I'm gonna backtrack a, a second and tell you also what we did um, that is very unique is, um, Jacob, if you'll go back to that picture of the map of the public library, um, that one. So, um, Knowing that our public library closed, um, our, our city public library, the River Oaks Library closed, um, we had a unique opportunity um, to partner with the Fort Worth Public Library. And we're excited because um, they're not, they have their own little Wi-Fi connectors and things, but that, that doesn't help us as much because one thing that we noted about our families is transportation is an issue. So we had to, figure out what we needed to do locally. This is a map of the, the public libraries around. So if you look at it, um, the blue and the red and the green is River Oaks and the communities that co come to our schools. So those are the closest public libraries to our, our city. So, but what Fort Worth Public Library did is number one, they are providing access. If, if our families can get to the public library, they're providing library cards to all of our students and staff. So they, they are already creating a partnership, but what they did do is they said, hey, we're going to, we have Sora, which is like Libby in the public library. We're gonna provide you access to our digital resources. So they're, we're, we're doing some, some thing. So that's one thing. So now what our next step is we're, I'm going to let Jacob talk to you about um, the um, what we've done with our bus. Sure. Um, so a broad overview of the project so far is that we have three 150 foot telecommunications towers that we have uh, radios on broadcasting a CBRS network. Um, we have, I would say about 80% uh, coverage of our entire school district. So we can provide to students and uh, community facilities uh, routers that connect back to our towers and provide a, a high-speed internet connection. Um, so, you know, we have that background setup. Um, and with that setup, we were able to um, you know, provide connectivity to our neighborhood access stations, uh, including the uh, community center listed here. Um, but also it allows us to have uh, devices on our school buses, including the MoBus um, pictured here that uh, broadcast Wi-Fi out uh, high powered access points that uh, allows, um, you know, students and community members both to, to connect to our network and access the internet. Um, and uh, Heather and her team of librarians have done a great job in, um, as she was saying earlier, you know, promoting MOBUS and to uh, drive to different community locations and provide books and digital resources and even food in many cases to um, students and community members in the area. Uh, in, ad in addition to that, um, uh, Heather is sort of leading the project to build the little free libraries. Um, and uh, as part of that project, we're also going to provide connectivity at each one of those uh, little free library locations. So we would have a, a router, um, you know, a Wi-Fi router uh, mounted on each one of these little free libraries that would broadcast a Wi-Fi signal uh, that anybody can connect to and, and get access to the Internet. Uh, Heather, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on the little free libraries that you're working on? 
No, we just, um, Jacob and I were brainstorming and, you know, it's just about access. So the one in the red and the blue one is just something, one of our CTE teachers built it and we just started brainstorming and then the kids are building the other ones. So Jacob said, hey, what do you think about putting a router in these? And um, I said, I think it's a great idea. So we're just working together with our community and it's once again, putting access. And I loved, I saw the first picture and I saw a little free library. It's it's just bringing access to our community. So that it's not hard, so, it's just- so cool. Yeah. That's wonderful, Heather, Jacob. We'll circle back here. I'm sure people have some questions, you know, how do you set up a CBRS network? But uh, it is mobile technology, which is uh, interesting as opposed to fixed wireless, makes it more complex, but more, more usable. Let's, uh, uh, let's keep going here and circle back. If you would, and I will pick this up. Hopefully I can do it fast enough. Okay. So uh, thank you for that. Sorry to be so uh, so squeezed with time here, but we just wanna cover the, the kind of a, more of an inventory than in depth. This is another project, another variation. This is fixed wireless using um, uh, five gigahertz, which can be uh, channeled, it's more or less microwave. So what you're looking at there is a diagram of uh, a link from the high school. And this is provided, This the, the backhaul for this is and actually the wireless setup by Network Nebraska, which is one of the educa state education networks that are uh, involved in providing uh, broadband to anchor institutions and picked up this project, it was another grant. Uh, so they're using uh, fixed wireless from the school building four miles away to the little town of Plymouth, Nebraska, 400 people to uh, uh, deliver, I don't think it's quite 500 megabits, but it's close to that. And it goes right John, to the library. Hello? John, I'm, I'm seeing your inbox. My inbox, that's not good. <laughs> So I am trying to share, stop share. Thanks for the coaching, share, there, okay. That's good. Now you can see, <laughs> so the, the, uh, the, the four mile direct line of sight signal from the school building, which is, you know, has, um, at least a gig, probably multi gigabit connection, uh, sending a multi hundred megabit wireless connection directly to the water tower in Plymouth, Nebraska, which then spreads the signal to various uh, points in the community, which create, and because it's so small, the town, you know, like the, the, we talk about rural in terms of density and we use the numbers of, uh, 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 of countywide density people per square mile across the county, which is really low. But when you look where people actually live, most rural people live close together in small communities. It might be a mile or two across. And Plymouth is a perfect example of that, which means that these, these few hotspots around town can cover almost the whole town and everybody can log on to the library or the school district. They have, they've split the SSID. So you go filtered through to the school district server or you can go through the open uh, library channel it's very cool and this whole thing was set up for i think about seventeen thousand dollars to connect a town that's phenomenal at least in our view uh, and so here is yet another technology uh, as you know by the way well it says five gigahertz that's that's our standard wi-fi 2.4 and five gigahertz with six gigahertz coming which would be more capacity and uh, more open frequency. So we're gonna turn now to uh, Diane in Pottsboro uh, where they're using educational broadband services spectrum, which operates in the three point, no, I'm sorry, 2.5 gigahertz range, which is excellent mid-band like CBRS is also mid-band 3.5 uh, in a fixed wireless uh, setup where the WISP tech wave is has the sub license from the community college and from the county school district to provide commercial services. 
Well, it doesn't reach everywhere. And, and, and also people you know, can't afford it everywhere. So what this project did was encourage Diane, a longtime colleague on a number of different projects, but encouraged Pots, Pottsboro to partner with the WISP to set up some of these neighborhood access stations so in, in various locations. I don't believe I've got any of them on that map, but that's okay. You can understand places that are not visible. So Diane, welcome. Please take a few minutes, very few minutes, please, and uh, walk us through this and we'll come back for a discussion. Let me get out of stop okay. here. Stop yes. Here. All right. Can, can you see my slides there? Uh, um, yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so just to give you a highlight of, and I will say, I will allay your fears about this being heavily um, technical because I'm not the technical person. And I emphasize that because um, one of my experiences through this whole big learning curve is that rural libraries see the needs of the community in an up close and personal way. You know, when we have patrons come in to us, but I didn't have the capacity or the technical skills to make this happen. It has only happened through a, a partnership with a, an awesome local WISP. So just to hit on a few of the highlights upper left there, the school district, when the pandemic started, the school district shared their students um, addresses who did not have internet in their homes. So those are all the blue markers. Lower right in that picture, you see the green marker. That's where I am now coming to you from the our telehealth room at the Pottsboro Library. We have the fastest internet connection in town. And then through Don and Gigabit Libraries Network, we have been able to set up neighborhood access stations closer to where some of those students live, the yellow, orange, and burgundy, I guess. Um, so one, this sounds so small town to me, the burgundy one is at a tackle shop. Um, the yellow one is at the volunteer fire to sta station and the orange is a convenience store. And so um, going closer to where people are because we have no public transportation in Pottsboro, including no ride sharing. So um, there are, to me, a surprising number of people without transportation of any kind. They don't have their own vehicles. So if, if it is not within walking distance, they can't get it. Um, I was fortunate to work with University of Michigan School of Information who did a, a whole semester trying to establish what the needs were and then attaching a narrative to that because broadband access can be such a dry Topic, I think it's important to tell the stories of the real people, not just the numbers. Um, and then Connected Nation came to Grayson County and I actually got to drive in their truck with them where they were mapping the real picture of what internet looked like and learned how to look for, okay, this white marker with the orange sign on it means this. And so, um, we were able to get a, a clear picture, not the FCC map, but a clear picture of, of what the picture looked like. Um, so upper left is the tackle shop there with the, uh, the uh, ITDRC, Information Technology Disaster Resource Center, um, at no cost to the library installed and monitors that at the tackle shop. Um, and that's an area with particularly um, a lot of barriers to access. And then also ITDRC set up this neighborhood access station in a um, parking lot of a hotel outside of, of town. And um, then talking about the EBS spectrum that TechWave has the license to, they have set up um, this tower in the parking lot of the library, you can't see it, but that tower is actually a temporary tower on a trailer. Uh, it's 35 feet um, tall, but it can be taken down and then even moved to another place. Through a $25,000 grant 
the Texas State Library, we were able to buy um, the upper right there. You see the equipment in there. So this EBS spectrum um, signal can reach within a one mile radius of the library. People come to the library, um, check out this um, client device and take it home and then have connectivity in their homes, which that's, you know, that's not the band-aid. That's the ultimate solution is so that they're not having to walk to the volunteer fire department or, or wherever to get access. They've got it in their home. So that's um, 40 homes that we were able to get for low income students. And just to, to finish up, I will say, again, speaking to rural libraries, capacity, limited capacity, um, what we have now going on is TechWave is helping us um, put together a consortium of all eight libraries in our county to apply for the ECF funding, because if you're a solo librarian or a librarian um, with just limited time, writing these narratives can be overwhelming. And so they are taking each library individually, writing the narrative. Pottsboro will be the lead applicant on it um, so that we can spread this throughout out the county. And JJ with TechWave has been spending a lot of time in Austin, our capital, you know, meeting with um, our representatives to make this happen um, in a big way. So that's that's kind of the overview of what I've got going on. Wow, Diane, every time we talk, you've got something new going on. And uh, this is just amazing. Uh, TechWave, the, the local commercial WISP there in, in Grayson County, uh, is like a number of these WISPs are more, I mean, it's, it's a business, it's a for-profit business, but they're more community oriented than providers that are not local and are much more responsive to community needs. Uh, no more people, you know, like the ability to, to get the sub license from the community college of the school district to set up this business uh, using this uh, 2.5 gigahertz, excellent frequency uh, in the EBS, which is not available everywhere. As I said in the beginning, all these uh, flavors of radio spectrum are available at different levels in different ways in different places so you need to know what you have finding that out is uh is one of the steps uh diane why don't you give a quick commercial for itdrc yes and john that was or don that was thanks to you itdrc um typically i think they're nationwide no cost to the libraries they have experts, volunteers all over the nation and hardware. And so typically I think they originated going in after Katrina, after hurricanes, flooding, fires, um, and they just help with connectivity. And I believe they are located in, in Fort Worth. So I contacted them and they asked what I needed and they came out and set it up and said, it's ready to go. So it, it, I mean, just could not have made it easier for me and left that truck in that parking lot, it's still there, right? They have moved that now and um, did the, the permanent at the tackle shop. Okay, well, so ITDRC, Information Technology Disaster Resource Center, itdrc.org, as Diane said, located in Fort Worth, but with volunteers, incredibly capable uh, technical people all over the country, some 2000 volunteers, and they, they go in anytime there's a disaster and help do recovery on communications. It's just amazing. And just contact them. If you're trying to do any kind of a project, even if you're not in a disaster right now, uh, they'll help you. It's, it's the biggest unsung resource in the country for connectivity. And uh, uh, so thanks, Diane. We'll try to come back here. Let me take over. Not email. Is that That's a, email. It's still email. <laughs> okay, let's try again.
Yeah, that works. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Fantastic story. Uh, our last wireless technology, sorry, it's so small there, uh, is the newest entry in the wireless campaign, uh, LEO satellites. So I don't know how many people have been following this story, but low earth orbit satellites is a long time dream of connectivity. It goes back at least 20 years, but no one's ever been able to pull it off. I mean, it's really complicated. So most people, uh, let me just reintroduce my location here. A lot of you came on later and why I'm wearing a hat and a parka is I'm sitting outside of the Cuesta, New Mexico uh, Public Library. It's a brand new library. They've just built it in the last year and they, they're not open till noon, but they run their Wi-Fi open. And I'm sitting here on a, on a bench and they even have an outdoor plug and, and uh, but, uh, in the mountains of northern New Mexico, it's 39 degrees outside, and I'm trying to keep warm. But this is great to have the resource. This is exactly what we've been talking about for libraries to help people in need. And, you know, I'm out here off the way off the grid, and the only way I'm going to be able to connect is to have some sort of an access like this. And I really appreciate it. Uh, a lot of people out here have connected. I mean, there's fixed wireless operators in rural areas. You're probably all aware of that. But there's also uh, limits to terrestrial wireless. And beyond those limits, which are numerous uh, locations, uh, people use geostationary satellite communications, which wasn't really set up originally for that. It was just set up for you know TV broadcast. But then you know, the internet arrived. They tried to move those into two-way communication. They're, they're way out, they're some 22 something thousand miles out and rotate around the earth at roughly the same rate that the planet rotates. So they appear stationary and then you can aim your dish out there and have some kind of service. It's not really satisfactory to most people I've spoken with, uh, uh, but if there's nothing else, it's what you've got. Uh, this is low earth orbit satellite and these are very close. These are these are like 300 miles up. And so that reduces the, the return time, the so-called latency and, uh, and the system though, then requires thousands of satellites crisscrossing the planet. Uh, and well, the, the closest analogy is the cell network where as we drive down the road, we hand off from tower to tower. In this case, we're stationary and the towers are flying and handing off uh, <laughs> overhead. So this is one of, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the projects that we've just been able to fund out of the last part of the grant. Uh, a handful of these are coming up. This was in Conrad, Montana. And here, uh, <laughs> uh, the librarian and the city IT staff, she has no IT staff like most rural libraries, they have no IT staff, they barely have staff at all, but the city then provides support. They're, they're kind of mugging it up, opening the box with the dish and the gear in it, it's, which is really that size, it's got a large pizza. And then these, there you see dishy on a rooftop after it's installed. And, you know, they went, when, they, when the city heard that they were getting this grant, they upgraded their signal to 25 megabits. And then this came in and it just kind of blew the doors off as they say, and they're tickled. So people are coming over there and, and hearing about it. They let the job service people use it. And so it's really, fun. Carolyn, thank you. Carolyn, are you here? I didn't, I, I hope you are. Uh, if you do raise your hand and, and we'll turn on your mic and you can uh, comment on how things are going. But uh, we're really interested in this particular technology whatever one may think of Elon Musk and all of his businesses and his politics or whatever else, he's creating something no one has been able to do yet again, uh, uh, a, a, a low earth orbit satellite, high speed, high performance broadband communication system that in theory will connect anywhere on the planet, not everywhere, but anywhere uh, because it has limited capacity, like all wireless has capacity limits but we don't yet know what that is. And our notion is, let's find out. 
And, and it's one thing to be able to connect anyone, but the cost of this, the retail cost for residential service, which has been their focus, they're not quite yet actually a commercial uh, phase. It's still in beta phase. Uh, and we were able to negotiate a beta license for a handful of libraries to try it out. So as libraries, these are obviously aggregated user sites and Starlink, which is the SpaceX subsidiary that's running this whole system, is concerned that, an, that too many people would try to use one location, one dish, and it would sort of drain the capacity out of the area, the cell, they call it, which is being supported by the, by the uh, orbiting satellites. Well, we just don't know uh, exactly what that impact is. That's part of what we're doing here is finding out how it works, how reliable it is, how fast it is, what impact it has on the community. Because if, you, if you're in a place like Conrad, Montana, nobody has good broadband. So now the one place it does is the library. So people are coming to there to find out how it works. Maybe they can order one if they want, but maybe they can't afford it. So if you can't afford $100 a month, which is the retail residential price, at least you can go to the library. It's a classic library situation. So um, uh, the first one actually is not far from where I am. And it's a tribal library in, in Northern New Mexico, Torreon Tribal Library. They were the, very, the world's first, what we say, LEO library. The first library in the world connected by a low earth orbiting satellite connection. And uh, we're working with Stephen and IFLA and some international partners to see how widely we can take that because there are still yet today roughly three and a half billion people close to half the world's population that are not connected and not to just connect all of them but it has the potential to create a hub in every community for serious broadband ideally as a place where you have librarians and people that can support uh, users training and, and so forth so we're excited about that. We'll get into more detail on how that all works at another session, because we'll have some data to share with you. But uh, for now, uh, we'll just call that the inventory and we will open it up. Uh, we're good, we've done it. <laughs> we're not totally out of time. Uh, so uh, please raise your hand if you've got any particular questions or if there's one of these technologies that's of interest to you. Uh, but uh, this has been kind of a high speed chase through the, through the inventory. Uh, you can put things in the chat. Okay, one more plug for ITDRC. Really call them up. If you're trying to do anything, call them up. They will definitely, uh, Mark uh, Colwell, also excellent resource there. Thank you, Cheryl, uh, or Roy, I guess that was, sorry. And uh, yes, Rochelle, more, more satellites are launching, you know, almost every month. Uh, they have now what they consider kind of the first shell. Uh, I think it's, it's under 2000 satellites. And then their, their kind of first plateau of a full deployment towards 10 or more thousand is like double the current number. So they're building it up slowly. You can't just order it because they're trying to allocate uh, licenses to places that are not overloaded. They've done a few in the city, so there's no reason they can't serve the city, but the cities are well served or comparatively well served. And their target is places that are really unserved, the most remote places. Uh, and, and we concur with that, as, at least as far as the, the libraries are concerned. They have just initiated, uh, they do require, this is something, I don't want to get too deep into it, but it, they require ground stations that are within 500 kilometers of the location. So that means the signal that goes up and then comes down has to, like all communication, has to go into the, the uh, global fiber network. And they have to have a ground station close enough to where that those satellites are passing to be able to get those signal down. What they're implementing with this new round, which they've just launched the first one, 60 at a time, uh, is uh, satellite to satellite communication, inter satellite communication, intra satellite communication using lasers. So that can go farther and wider uh, and take out some of the need for these ground stations, which have to be sitting on fiber, which of course is not everywhere. So 
they're trying to solve these these issues and we think it's really interesting uh yeah bob boker good to, good to see you bob bob leads broadband policy for ala if you if you don't know that and he's put up a link there to see the the maps there's of course a subreddit on this and there are elon fanboys galore out there they're we're we're holding judgment early reports are positive but that's usually it, the way it is with technology when it first out before it's really put through the large scale paces. Um, anybody, anybody? Well, okay. Then I'd like to go back to uh, Jacob to talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about the CBRS system and how, how complex that was. I mean, are, are, are you a radio engineer by training? And is it, it, it can't be a DYI system. I mean, for anybody, you have to be really capable to set something like that, that up, right, Jacob? You're muted, Jenny. Okay, gotcha. Um, yes, so uh, it could be DIY if you chose to do it that way. Um, you would just have to get um, a installer license um, through, there, there are multiple organizations that you can, uh, get a uh, CBRS installer license from, but um, uh, yeah, you can you can do it DIY, but it is very difficult, especially um, you know coordinating with um, you know local governments and other organizations in the area that may be using that spectrum. Um, the spectrum access system is supposed to um, sort of eliminate those uh, coordination issues, but uh, it is not. I have found that it's not developed to a point where that is actually the case. Um, so you do have to, uh, if you do deploy a CBRS network, you do have to work closely with other organizations in your area, especially um, military bases and um, you know state and local government as well. So it, it was kind of a, an issue in the beginning phases, but I think we've got it ironed out at this point. Well, it's still amazing. At least it's amazing to me that uh that a school district could do this for its for its community for its students and its wider community and we've encouraged these school library partnerships from the beginning uh, they're they're actually not that common for school districts and public libraries to have formal relationships you know they're different different governance different revenue models and so forth but incredible overlap of their actual constituents and so it, we couldn't be happier that you're supporting the public library and those communities around that, that need additional support. There's a question you might be able to uh, answer here, uh, Jacob, from Cheryl, who asked the most logical question. How do you find out which spectrum options are available in your area? And how do you locate a company that works with that? Not easily. Um, so I don't know that there's a comprehensive list of um, you know what spectrum is available depending on your geography. But what you can do if you want to spend the time is you can go um, and you can search um, your geolocation on um, you know the FCC's portal and see who has licenses for what spectrum. Um, and it may be possible, I'm not sure, to see uh, what spectrum is open and available to use. Uh, but really, it's going to be a resource, um, the FCC portal, that is, um, a, a resource to see what uh, carriers and what companies are in your area and have access to what spectrum. So then you could reach out to them and, um, you know, try to, uh, to make a deal with them to, to use that spectrum or to just um, use their resources as a company. Good. It, you're right. It's not an easy answer, uh, but it's a it's an important question, right? I mean, what are your options uh, before you dive into it? Well, it really sounds great to use EBS, uh, you know, but maybe it's not available uh, because this is really valuable spectrum that a lot of commercial providers have uh, appropriated. A lot of it has been taken back by the FCC and then auctioned off because it's so desirable. It has uh it has penetrating capabilities which is the lower frequencies have and it also has high capacity higher capacity which is it's kind of the sweet spot i guess uh, tv white space has longer range and penetrability but the lower frequency will carry fewer bits so you know there's all all kinds of trade-offs 
I would refer to ITDRC and ask them if, if they've got these engineers, they can go out with a spectrum analyzer and tell you what's who's using what, and then they can access this FCC database and find out who's using it. Uh, the local WISP, like uh, Diane is partnered with there in Pottsboro, Texas, is a good resource. Uh, they may not be particularly interested in helping you set up your own system rather than using their commercial service, but you just don't know. Maybe they're not interested in what you're doing, or maybe they'll help you. Uh, you, well, you just have to take some initiative. Don, I would add that, um, it, am I correct, Diane, that you're working with TechWave? Yeah. That's right, yes. Okay. Yeah, JJ has been, JJ with TechWave has been, uh, you know, an awesome resource for me. He, he um, contacted me um, through the uh, Shelby Coalition, um, and he reached out and he was super helpful in, um, you know, providing resources to me for, you know, different conferences and different um, funding methods and things of that nature for our project. He wasn't selling anything. He, he was just trying to, uh, you know, help out a, a local school district here. So props to, to JJ from TechWave. And, and, and props to uh, Shelby, now that you've uh, mentioned Shelby, which it's not a technical group, it's a, it's a national policy advocacy group, but it's also a network of, uh, of shared interests and, and a great place. I would, uh, uh, we have, I believe, the executive director, uh, John Windhausen, and the chairman of the board of Shelby, uh, Rochelle Chong, on with us today. Uh, we, GLN, we're, we're a, a co-founder of Shelby and we've met a lot of wonderful people and a great resource, not just on policy, but like uh, Jacob just made the point, Diane's nodding her head. Uh, this is it's a place to find people, find out what they're doing, how they've done it, and learn a lot uh, because you need support on this. Absolutely, it's difficult. Bob Boker is you know, a lot of you I recognize are, are Shelby activists. It's a great group. I suggest if you don't know about it, shlb.org, look it up and consider joining. It's really uh, very uh, reasonable dudes. Uh, so we're coming up on the hour. Anybody, any questions for our, for our guest speakers or uh, for me or on anything else? I'm trying to follow the chat here. Uh, Tribal Broadband Summit. Uh, thanks, Mala. Mala said she's made almost every one of these sessions. That is heroic. I mean, I could barely do that. <laughs> uh, but it's the, 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 these tribal libraries are classically in underserved areas, poorly served. And uh, the one I mentioned had a geostationary uh, connection. And they also have a TV white space network there, which, you know, the backhaul from a geostationary uh, satellite is not that great to begin with to feed a wide area network. They've been struggling. And so now they're looking to use this uh, higher speed LEO to feed that network. We'll see how that works out. But, hey, Don? Yeah. No, oh, John. Hey, Don, I'm sorry to interrupt you in mid sentence. No, no, no. But, uh, I, I, I was pleased to hear the discussion of Shelby. And I just thought I would uh, give a quick note, an invitation to everybody on the call that Shelby is putting together a new group uh, focused on uh, how to extend wireless service from the school and libraries to the community. So just exactly what Diane and Jacob are doing. Um, and I think the reason why we're putting this group together is I think there's not really a good understanding in Congress about these opportunities to work with a WISP or to do it yourself because the ECF legislation was so focused on hotspots and cable modems. Um, so we're trying to put a group together to help educate policymakers, the FCC and congressional uh, staff about you know, what Diane and Jacob and others are doing around the country and what you're promoting. Um, and this uh, group that we're putting together, it's, it's not just open to Shelby members. Uh, anyone could join, at least at this stage. We're trying to formulate now how we're going to govern this group going forward. But the purpose is to highlight this kind of activity that you've been promoting through these websites. So we're really looking forward to developing that, that group. 
So just thought I'd uh, invite everybody to join us. That's very good news, John, and, and absolutely what's needed. Uh, nobody really is interested in wireless that doesn't have a direct stake in it. Nobody just wants to kind of learn about it like they do, I don't know, a new shampoo or something. It's, it's complex. The, the point is, it's important. It's really important because it's not going to be, become less used or less useful or less important. And so the, even to be a knowledgeable buyer of, of uh, wireless services requires a little bit of education. John, if you have a link to that group or uh, just someplace people could, uh, uh, you know, contact you and find out what's happening, please put it in the chat. And because uh, that sounds like a great activity. The, uh, we had just submitted a proposal uh, called uh, uh, Through and To the Library. So it's a play on to and through, which you sort of described as fiber to the library and wireless through the library, which is the most common. But if there's no fiber to the library, then maybe there's a wireless solution to the library while they're waiting on the fiber. And that's one of the things that excites us about the LEO option is that it can happen quickly. Now, they're not open yet for orders, but if you're interested in that, if you'd like to get one of these, uh, we'll talk to you about it. Send me a message directly, info at giglibraries.net, and I will uh, chat with you about it, and I'll hook you up with Starlink to see if, in fact, uh, it works for you in your area. It has to be analyzed to see if they've actually got coverage. They don't actually have it everywhere, but, you know, and, and they have limits on some of the cells as well. So that could be a solution while, like in California, there are some libraries, about 100 or some left out of the 1,100, 1,200 libraries in California that are beyond the reach of wire, uh, the fiber and even beyond the reach of the current fixed wireless operator, uh, Geolinks, uh, another Shelby member, by the way, but doing outstanding work with fixed wireless uh, out there. So even these operators are ha have limits on how far terrestrial wireless will go. And it still takes time. You have to build towers and so forth. With these satellites, you just they mail you a box and you pop it open, you plug it in and it starts itself. And the little dish kind of has a motor on it. It aims it up there and says, here I am. And the network says, okay, you're now, you know, unit 61 BQ and these are your instructions on where you're gonna receive your signals. And that's it. It's, you just, it's, it's literally plug and play so far. And that they, they, they bundle a router in there so you don't have to plug it into your own system, but you can, of course. So that's a bridge. So that was what we meant by through and two. Through if you've got fiber, two if you don't yet have fiber. And we will continue to work on you getting fiber as John is doing every day there at Shelby along with all his compatriots. Uh, John says two and through, that was, that's the Shelby mantra, of course, first fiber and then wireless. We've gone beyond through and two, assuming you're two and, and, assume, and now it's through and two, you're not even two yet. So we put through first and that's the way that's working out. Uh, anybody, we're at the hour. We're at the hour. Got a great session here. I thank everybody for uh, participation and making the time as we usually do. We'll hang out for a little while for just kind of casual chat. So, Stephen, if you would stop our recording now. Oh, well, well, before you do that, before you do that, Stephen, uh, would everybody unmute for a second, please? Unmute, everyone. Unmute. Just please unmute. Because if we were together in a room in a conference, like the Shelby conference that they're not having, unfortunately, this year, our guest speakers, we would give them a round of applause. And that's what I'd like to do right now is please give a, give a hand for our speaker. <laughs> Great, great. Okay, thanks everybody from Chile, northern New Mexico. Thanks to the Cuesta Library for the connection. Uh, a plug for them. Uh, they they have no idea what's going on, but that's okay, right? They don't really care. They just want to be helpful, and they have been. So we'll uh, we'll see you next. Okay.